The Team Never Quit podcast is brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union, and thanks to their flexible terms, you can use Navy Federal savings options for all kinds of goals, short or long term. You can check all of this out at NavyFederal.org. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button wherever you get your show. So today, before we get to our very special and awesome guest, let's kick it off with our weekly Patreon question of the week. And this week, I, I like this one a lot. So out of all the Will Ferrell characters out there, all the movies he has, what is your favorite character of him? Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell. And I'll kick it off because I absolutely love in the other guys whenever he's Gator. Whenever his alter ego turns yeah, into Gator. That's one of my favorite movies. Of oh, movie. dude. I'd have, uh, do you know him, Will Ferrell? I've never met him. I, I haven't either. I want to, but I haven't met him yet. What, do you, you watch his movies? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been around a lot of the, a lot of other characters from Saturday Night Live, but only because they came to visit whenever Celebrity I was taking care of at the time. So I'm 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 just a fly in the wall there. So What's your favorite know. movie he does? You know he's he does great work, and there's so many to pick from. But I'm gonna have to go with the easy one. Santa. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna go with that too. <laughs> I mean, that's the first one that pops in my head is Elf. Elf. Every time. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, that's a timeless. Every Christmas we have that on. Who? Maybe at least 50 or 60 times. I'm not even kidding. I mean, I, I'll, I'll watch Old School, The Other Guys. I'll go through the whole Will Ferrell gambit. If it's on, I'll, I'll check it out. But it's mandatory that Elf rolls on during Christmas. I, I think that, and the only other time it pops in that I made. Uh, it, that daddy's home. Oh, I. I <laughs> He he comes down and w there was one where he wasn't the, uh, the the main character. He comes down in the end because he was the guy everybody looked up to to get all oh, the Oh, Chaz. That it. <laughs> Wedding Crashers. He goes to the, yeah. Oh, he that's goes a to phenomenal the role. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that Chaz is the other one. Bomb the meatloaf. Bomb meatloaf. Dude. You know how many times I screw that I yell that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> The nunchucks are around he's his great. neck. He's a star. Like that's if you want to know, there's a few of them out there that when you say that his name, man, everyone lights up. And what do you what do you think? I think Daddy's home. I think the difference between him and Mark Wahlberg, their characters oh, yeah, like, in Daddy's absolutely. Home, is so funny and how he's he just wants to be a dad so bad and he's trying. He just tries so hard. <laughs> yeah. And God, he can play that role great. And he comes across as this super nerdy super guy. Super Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> and he just wants to be accepted. I just, I think that's so Those funny. Those two persons, him and, him and Mark's personalities in real life are- They are, yeah, it's, they it's do great chemistry. movies I, I together. I just saw that for the first time recently, but uh, I maybe it was, I don't know if there was a sequel to that, but- There is. Uh -huh. Wahlberg's father? Was in this one? Yes. Who who played that character? Uh, oh, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. That's the one I. Yeah, yes. that's when Sully rolled down the escalator. Okay. Yes. At the end. <laughs> yes. That was, the one. that was great. That was those. That's, those are Christmas movies mandatory as well. Daddy's Home and Daddy's funny, Home man. Two are two of my favorite, but so is Wedding <laughs> Crashers. I love that movie. Well, and I love what Elf. Was it Chaz. That's Chaz. Yeah, that was one. Mm -hmm. Freaking Chaz, man. He's that, got so many. Yeah, that is a really good question. I feel like he picks like that that he knows that guy. I feel like Chaz might have been a real person that they knew and he just kind of I mean at least I, he played it like that. Now he did do that movie um oh my gosh Hunter what's the name of it, it when he was in Norway? Uh Eurovision. 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 I love that one too. Yeah. So funny. So Dude, Blades of Blades, Blades of Glory. Glory yeah. The Eurovision the first time I watched it I was like what the f am I watching? The Step Brothers. Step Brothers is my all-time favorite movie. But after I watched Eurovision a second time, I actually laughed at it. Yeah, it gets funny the more. I mean, yeah. the, the, the songs are gotta, actually pretty catchy. Yeah. I've got to go outside the question too, and and just address, you know, the, the work he did on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. But one one 
uh, skit was when they were doing, uh, well, Christopher Walker. Shit, more like, cowbell. Yeah. Dude, bro, <laughs> more freaking cowbell <laughs> is, is a go-to if I need to laugh. Yeah, he, he's, he can hit your funny bone. Yeah, yeah that doing his freaking guts hanging outside was... of that freaking sweater, and he goes to rap it on that thing. Yeah. That's the funniest. You if he needs about? more cowbell, uh, more, I think oh. we should just give it to Dude, him. Dude, if you got a fever, <laughs> we got the prescription, man. It's more freaking cowbell. <laughs> That's a good question. Oh. All right, yeah. way to go. Thank you again for doing this, man. I, I I'm looking forward to this because I, especially our listeners, they love hearing from team guys. Especially ones that that came down before I did, and it's, it's just the overall where you come from and how'd you get into this whole life, and and the way we normally do that is we start from the beginning. Like where were you? Where, where were you born? I don't well, even know this. Let me just tell you, uh, Marcus and Melanie, it's an honor, and and thank you for even thinking of me. Uh, you know, it's just great to be sitting here, where it all happens. <laughs> this is where the this is it right here. Happens, yeah, how about man? that? That's what it looks like. Uh, and you came all the way to Texas for it. God bless you. Oh, man. This is it. <laughs> it was a magic house. <laughs> so it's it. an honor to be here. And uh, all right. Uh, I, I don't really know why I'm here again, but I'll take it because love you guys. Thank Anything. you. Thank you. Well, uh, I was born in upstate New York. I think uh, the, the main significance of that is my father was a Korean War Marine. Oh, okay, wow. And he was born and bred in Queens, New York. And uh, I was raised, well, you can imagine, you know, what I see that picture up there on the wall of one of my favorite actors, Robert Duvall. And uh, I believe he did a movie called The Great Santini. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, Marines are unique people. And the system is unique. And uh, Marines are different people altogether. It's a tough, tough world. How about that? You know, I, I agree. And, and that's the thing. My dad was one of those guys. So that's how we were raised. When they get out there, they stay the same. They, they, they carve them and mold themselves into more of a Marine. It's, it's amazing to watch. I agree. I agree. And I got nothing but bad things to say about good Marines, right? Those, those, those guys and gals, they do their freaking job. People used to ask me afterwards, who do you like to work with best? Because we work with everybody in the everybody world else. pretty much at one point or another. And I'd have to say, if it wasn't a frog man, it would be a Marine. Because one thing's for sure, their heart is big. Man, they can work. And it never runs away. Mm. And Whatever I'm, they do to them and... Putting it when they come back through training, you can see it. Like they, they physically look different in the face. Like their eyes are different. Absolutely. And and then there's been evolutions, you know, they get in trouble and they have to back off on certain things. But a Korean war Marine, I mean, they can still beat the you know what? Well, that's what molds them is the is the battles they've been in. They Absolutely. throw some freaking lead and blood and Absolutely. spit everywhere around. Those story I, I keep some of those battles on my calendar. We should we should make we should make a battle calendar for people because the dates of, oh, that's a good idea. of the Alamo, the dates of the yeah, Chosan yeah. Reservoir, there's so many battles that I try and put in my calendar to remember. Can't share them with anyone because no one else would appreciate them like we do. But though those dates in, in Chosan, you know, that that was, well, it, it, it goes beyond words sometimes. Well, we try and do it with the movies, too, on Veterans Day, but there's so many good ones oh, now. Oh, for sure. That by the time Veteran Day is over with, you haven't even seen a whole branch of service. Yep. yep. Well, now you can start at 9-11 and go all the way to Veterans so, Day. Yeah, now we've got so many days <laughs> on the books where we've been in something that it's, it's almost filled up the calendar. Good point. Good point. So you got any brothers, sisters? I have one brother. Older? He is. He is. And... Uh, uh, we're not very close, not not like the blessed relationship you have there. But I will tell you this: I'm I'm very proud of his his service. I'm very proud of him as an operator, and uh, he retired out of the teams and and ended up doing some good work in the private world as well. But uh, he came to the special team long after I left, and he'll he'll forget that he said this. But uh, it was one of the things that happened because I kind of. You went through before he did? No, he he was always very military minded. I wasn't. He actually went to the Citadel. 
Oh, nice. Charleston. And he, oh, I know it. he left in his junior year because he just didn't want to wait anymore. But he did all the research. Uh, when we were younger, we had a handyman that worked for our neighbor. He was a Vietnam UDT frog. Straight up was a real one? Yep, real deal. And, and you know, the kind of guy you'd imagine. He, 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 he was a good-looking blonde guy, wore shorts and a shirt, worked like a son of a gun. He Tanned was, all the time, always, yeah, good-looking. Yeah, them guys. He was by himself, you know what I mean? He, yeah. he, he This is a guy who isn't going to work for anybody else. It's not going to work out that way. Yeah. See, he was his handyman. His truck had all his tools, but... It was, it was my brother's opportunity to talk to him. And then when he was at the Citadel, he did research. Uh, I mean, there's some listeners probably won't, won't be happy about this, but the research was what is America's most capable, unique, toughest special warfare unit. That's how they sold it. Mm-hmm. That, that's in the advertisement. That's not something we made up. Mm-hmm. No, no, absolutely. The reason we say that is because that's how it's advertised when we sign up. That's what draws us to that. And then, yeah, we fall into that and become that, but especially with them guys. And there's reasons for it. Sure. We can get into, but so that's what happened. And and now I uh, I actually uh, played lacrosse and uh, I had a partial scholarship. I'd broken my shoulder wrestling in my junior year, so uh, I'd wrestled for a long time, six years up to that point. But um, I'm talking to him and he's in buds. He was in class 106. I ended up being class 110. Come on. And I'm talking to him, and everything he's telling me is like really cool. It is. Wait, what year is that? 1979. That's yeah. the year I was born. Man, okay, so he's old school. Yeah, but now here's, here's the surprise that you didn't ask about. So as a kid, I uh, I don't even know how to explain it, so I'll just make the short part of it. I was only really good at climbing, and I was always climbing buildings. Well, I was good at a lot of stuff, but let's go jump to high school. I I didn't mean that a lot of stuff. Let's just say if it wasn't wrestling season, wrestling wasn't very popular at, at our school. I had to wrestle because it was my lacrosse coach was a wrestling coach. And I'm so glad I did because it was the greatest sport I ever played. But beyond that, I guess you'd call me a hood. But I was the kid that everyone in high school came to if they needed something in the school. They left their homework there. They left their jacket there. Seniors wanted their jerseys or something because I could get in that school any day I wanted, any time, anywhere. And I ended up being the one that stole the other team's mascot, this 15-foot-tall <laughs> Viking. And that carried on, believe it or not, into the Navy, into the few real missions that I had. And, um, well, there was a reason I told you that where we left off, but that was my thing. And and, and I could get in anywhere and get anything. How'd you, so it was your brother, how how did he initially find out about the SEAL program? Back because it it wasn't big. From the neighbor. He. Besides, just just that guy? He specifically, like I say, he he was always very oriented towards the military. And he specifically did research and went to school to look it up. And then, of course, when he was at the Citadel, he continued on. Okay. And so when I talked to him. Because even when you would get into recruiting, they wouldn't talk about it. Well. That was the thing. He, he, he knew it, and he knew it back of the hand. And that's why when I was talking to him, it was so cool. But that's where I got off track. I had, uh, well, I, I, I better not say, but I, I have Paul Newman's race jacket. He used to race at Watkins Glen, and, and one of my teachers was a shop teacher. I, I didn't take the jacket. I just, uh, someone and I came across it. But uh, on this particular day, there was this big program. I'm from a place called Corning, New York, and it's very famous for Corning Glass. Mm-hmm. And Corning Glass is responsible for a lot of war stuff, but everything from uh, fiber optics, you name it. And it's, 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 it's an amazing company. And during the summer, they had the summer theater. It was a really big production, and, and actors would come. And uh, I forget who the actor was. I, actually, I think it was uh, somebody I ran into later on down in my life. Uh, a famous singer. I can't remember if it was uh, Engelbert Humperdinck or whoever it was. But 
Anyway, I went to the show and they had these great costumes, big velour robes. It was a King Arthur kind of thing. And uh, believe it or not, I was able to get in the glass center as priceless artifacts and quite a security system and everything. And I just wanted one of those robes. Oh my gosh. Remember, I'd always get everything. I, I had the master key to both my school and the rival school. And so I got that robe and uh, I got a few other things. And I thought King Arthur's crown is cool. And the only reason I'm telling you this is I ditched everything in the attic of our house. And my mom and dad found King Arthur's crown and right away knew where it came from. And they were scared to death because their whole life, both my parents retired from Corning Glass. And they're thinking, oh my God. Somebody's going to find out that our son stole all this. We're going to lose our pension. And, and they were able to get rid of it. And so right then and there was a day. It was a bad day for me. And it was like, you know what? I'm not going to go to college. I'm just going to college to play lacrosse. I'm not going to college because I want to go to college. I'm going to do what my brother's going to do. And that's how it happened. You ended up in the military. <laughs> but once I was in, you know, the Navy, uh, even boot camp, was he, was he an officer? No. He, he, he came was, in. You said he left early, so I, I didn't. No, I did. He did. He, he stayed in. Yeah, through the Citadel? He went through the Citadel, all the way through the Citadel? Oh, well, he left the Citadel early. Yeah, yeah junior there year, right? Go. Yeah, okay, check. He, he left the and Citadel. And then y'all both city. enlisted in the Navy. Right. And then he, both went to Bud's. He got his, 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 uh, his degree later, but through the Navy, and right. he, he never went to OCS or anything. So when, when it was in Coronado when y'all when checked in? Yes. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Because have you been to the compound lately? No, but I, I've heard there's... Yeah, I wouldn't know I, it. I, I didn't know. even recognize it. It's unbelievable. Oh, wow. It's Mortuary. crazy. It is unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. It's not even at the same spot. It's what you think a SEAL team should look like. It, it is. I mean, it, when you walk... I remember it had when you came in there. And then the reputation you guys made, y'all built what we lived in. And you see that sucker now, mm. it's something. It's state of the art. Very, very nice. It looks I like love, Men in Black. I love That's the, kind of what it looks like. I love the sound of it, but there was still something that was romantic to me about the way it used to be where you could actually go on the strand and people walked by the Bud's three-story building. And it was, a, it was a hell of a time. I mean, the people in the Coronado Caves there, we were their entertainment. Yeah, he very well. Oh, at the people. Dell too, and the Dell, and sure, the Dell, sure. still entertainment for them. Well, that's good. During Hell Week, the the Rock Portage when they when they come in and beat yep. the crap out of us there, they love watching that. I remember one day. I I'm not going to tell you the story, but I remember one day I was running down the beach on my own. It was winter time. Again, people were able to come right past a compound, and I look out in the surf zone, and there's somebody's hand, up and down the surf. And I'm looking around, there's no one around. I'm thinking, you know, before you, you could be pranked. I didn't have the word. Is somebody playing a game on me? And, and no, there's somebody out there in the surf zone. Well, you know, you're a frog man. Something that I've always carried. Uh, our responsibility is all inclusive. There's somebody in the surf, I'm going. And you know, it's winter, it's cold water, I got nothing on. It's always cold. So I go, I'm watching this hand, I'm trying to swim, I'm trying to use what I learned, I've gotta be careful, I gotta be ready to dive under at the last minute, because I can't see them coming up, but their hand's there, so they're still alive. It's not just, you know, a, 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 a hand on the surface, it's sticking up. So I get closer and I get just ready to dive. It was a sex doll. <gasps> And the hand was sticking up because the air had gone up to just the oh hand. And just gosh. when I go to, I see this face yeah. with the red lips. Does anybody in the teams know that story? Because I can't believe it. We do now. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I can't wait to send you something in the mail. Well, imagine now, though, I got to come out of the surf zone and I'm looking around. Dragging anybody the, see me? I'm trying to cover my doll. head. Yeah, right. And I did not save the doll. I left it there. So I hope I didn't you no. know, ambush somebody Returned it to, else. to where you found it. Oh, as a good frog man, right? <laughs> Return it where you found it. Better than you found it. To this day, did somebody set me up? I don't know. That's right. So what <laughs> was Bud's class 110 like? How many How many of y'all started and how many finished? You know, I, I'm, I probably won't remember numbers exactly, but I, I think it was because I've had to answer that before. I think it was around 86 guys started. We graduated 23. Are you winter class? 
Um, or half and half. It had half winter in it. We graduated uh, December 5th. That's one day I always remember for me. That's my anniversary. Mm. What, what is it? December 5th? December 5th. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so you're half and half. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My brother, I, hey, team guys will find any way to be tougher than any other team guy because we have a pure winter class. Yeah. There's oh, one I class. Know, I know. Those some bitches are hard. Isn't that oh, you? and, and That's I, me. I guarantee you the water was colder. And the rocks are probably heavier for those guys, too. Absolutely. Well, of course they were. The big, yeah, they're big. <laughs> yes, sir, they were. Uh, we, we did so was your one. brother there when you were there, or had he already graduated and went out? He literally graduated a year ahead of me. So that's what I did with my brother. It, was uh, it? Yes, sir. So well, t technically there was some in between, but um, I, I got stuck in the pipeline a long time because I was a, a medic. Eighteen Delta. So they sent me to Bragg for a long, 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 long time, and then uh, when I when I got back, I caught up with him. Matter of fact, I got my Trident a couple like a day before he got he graduated. How about that? It was great. I mean, it was great. So. He, your brother did your brother so did he like tell you what was going down yeah oh yeah all the time y'all did that yeah yeah so i swear it away hell week you know and and, and uh, what do we call that before hell week breakout breakout i was all i knew exactly what was coming and that didn't get to you breakout kind of freaked me out no i was ready i was ready I, and i'll tell you that though um did you did you incur this now this was my so what probably in the very beginning, I can't tell you what kind of day, but we're standing for our first inspection, I think. And of course, I, I knew how to polish a boot from my brother slash and, and my dad. So I'm squared away. Uniforms, immaculate, boots are like glass. And our, our uh, proctor, that was what he's called, our class proctor. Comes so it's still, still saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at everybody's name. And, you know, just like the movie, Lee Marvin going down the line, you know, giving guys a, where are you from, son? Never heard of it kind of thing. And, oh, yeah. And then he gets in front of me and he sees my name. Karachi. Don't tell me you had a brother that came through here oh, a year ago. Same thing, right? Oh, yeah. 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 And that's of course, the worst. He, he, he just, your brother, that fat piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and beyond that, then he looks at my belt buckle and, God damn it, I made the fatal error. He's looking, he can't find a thing. And then he takes my belt buckle in front of me and tilts it just a little bit. And he says, Karachi, look down there. What do you see? Of course, a little dribble of brass out there. Yeah. So that was my first day. I had to hit the surf, and I wasn't smart enough like the other guys to go over the berm and then take their boots off because you, then you got to shine them. I went in with everything. Okay, so I didn't like, know that yeah. trick either. No one, no one told me that trick either. And that 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 inspection beatdown is the worst. Now the thing though is in those days for me there were only a couple of brother teams in, and one right, of right, them right. was was the Bond brothers. And that, that was very significant because one of my roommates, Billy Robinson, was a great kid. He was an ensign. He lost his life on the Grayback. The Grayback was a huge incident that occurred. Uh, no, for, for the listeners who don't know, it was an old diesel sub made for SEAL team. It had two chambers on it. And, and uh, one of the Bond brothers was one of my instructors. Well, they were together. One brother was in one chamber, one was in the other, and the one chamber is where guys died, and Billy was killed, and one of the Bond brothers, and he had to be there to try and resuscitate his brother. That's one thing about the teams that the rest of the military doesn't do. We honor brothers, and we'll let brothers serve together because we know what brothers will do for oh, each other. Mm -hmm. they, when I got to roll out with Morgan, they were just gonna ride in the same Humvee together, oh. or, or Hilo. Other than that, it was game on. Yep. I lived right beside each other in the tent. Even when when he became an officer, you know, that kind of... He's an older brother, and he's always treating me like shit. Older so he, by seven minutes. He fit, he fit right into that officer. <laughs> oh, you get it. Can you believe that? Yeah, that seven minutes that makes full? a huge difference. It's huge. <laughs> he, he'll tell you it does. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure. Daily. Yeah, I'm sure. I'll give him his money later, but yeah, he told me, you know. And I, I can't take anything from him. He gave me all the crap on he, you. All, all the instru I mean, like, I was a witness to this. I saw him get his ass beaten buds, and they still gave him Honor Man out of that. Wow. I know, right? What up? What up? Oh, yeah. You, overachieving. You suck if your I brother suck. was Honor I Man. Know. What were you? I uh, dishonor Man? <laughs> uh, I don't know. No, I didn't even get fire in the gut, man. I'm the anchor man. 
Like, hey, Latrell, good job, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I could just take a beating. Whatever that dude is. The goon. I was, I was in the goons. I was with the goons, man. You got to have them. Oh okay, so gosh. was first phase and second phase the same or was it reversed when you went through? Was dive phase first? No. No. Uh, first phase was just, you know, the PT. Holy shit. Hell Tell me the story about the, the, the guy on the pull-up bar. Oh, okay. Okay, so... That's second this phase. is this sets Ting got tone right here. So this is second phase, and um, you know first phase is done. Hell week's done, and one of the things I'm I'm kind of proud of is once again you know I I am being a rebel because if you see a picture of our Hell Week graduation, I'm the only guy without a hat on, and you got to have your cover on. It's just I don't know I didn't do it on purpose. It's just kind of thing. Is that just right after Hell Week? Right after Hell Week. I mean, come on. Yeah, you know. So now Screw it's your ass away, huh? <laughs> second phase is starting. Oh yeah. And for those who don't know, the old the old buds compound and there was a three story apartment building and first phase lives on the first floor, second phase on the second floor, third phase on the top floor, and uh, Hell Week is done right there. They stop doing that and they move you to yeah, offsite. Yeah. So we're in our room for Hell Week and they come right in with the flashbangs, the machine guns, and trash your room and all that. Anyway, second phase. We had one of the instructions in the second phase was just a huge guy, tall like Marcus, uh, but uh, I, I mean, he, he was just beyond being human. And second phase starts, and we're, we're going out to the, the grinder for our first PT, and here is this guy, Lieutenant Pearson. He's wearing our tanks in those days, which were twin steel 72 a cubic inch scuba tanks. Scuba tanks. Yeah, dual, and these things are heavy to say the least, out of water. Well, Mr. Pearson is doing pull-ups with these scuba tanks, and he'd walk across the guy and do ten pull-ups, and we're looking at this guy and thinking, "Holy crap!" <laughs> because the first thing you think about—that's awesome, I, by the way. That's not, that's intimidating. Well, I got to tell you, that's the thing. I'm thinking, Jesus, I, I might not make it. Might not the first make time it. I'd say, exactly, Jesus, can I make exactly it? Exactly what you think. Like, hey, man, I don't know if I can get to that. I, I don't think I didn't I even think you could do that. That's like doing pull-ups with two people. Somebody's on his right? back. Yeah, two people on his back over here doing pull-ups. And he's doing them slow. You know, uh, more muscle, more muscle. Uh, what do they call it? more muscle tissue use? Slowly pull them up. I'm thinking, Jesus, this is amazing. Well, remember, I was the guy that climbed in, sneaked in. Well, that didn't stop at buds either, because guys wanted extra blue and gold, or they wanted an extra K bar. So I got into the supply room. And I'm now I'm I, I'm rummaging around locked areas where students, you know, are not supposed, not to, supposed be. to go. Yeah. And I'm in the second phase area now where the instructors are, and I just happened to a door was open. I just happened to close the door and look behind it, and what do I see behind that door? I see these twin seventy-two cubic inch scuba tanks, and I thought. Man, those look like the ones Mr. Pearson uses. And I grabbed them, and they were styrofoam. What? Hollywood made them. <laughs> and they look just like the real thing. And there's Mr. Pearson hey, what am I killing in? us. And they were styrofoam. It was a <laughs> They do that crap to us all the time, and you don't know it. And that, that. What dude, a great sense of humor, too, though. That was the beauty. Of, uh, and, and one of the most unique things about the teams that I will never forget is there's always a degree of humor, no matter how bad it is. No matter how bad. We, we, if you can't do that, you almost cannot be a frogman. And that degree of humor has, has saved a lot of lives. Let me, let me tell you something, because look at the duality of that. Because like, when we were sitting there looking at it, like that's so, he did that on purpose to intimidate the ones to get out of there. But, it, but think about how hard it is to keep a straight face when you're doing that. <laughs> oh, man, and you are it's so It's like that guy right who, who um, that. drinks the sweet tea in the Jack Daniels bottle. So Just right Just that sucker down, and you're like, what the, how did you, <laughs> how'd that happen? And, and, and I mean, did. what a great sense of humor. He did. He straight faced the whole way through. But that humor thing, I got to tell you, so in, in our Bud's breakout, my class leader, he, he'll, he, we haven't talked in years, so not not that we don't. It's just that you know I was a pain in the ass in buds, so people grow up, they don't remember that you've grown up too. They probably just remember the way I was. But my class, hey, I think that might be a real thing because I run. <laughs> absolutely, I think that might be a real thing. Like, hey man, I remember you from buds. I'm like, 
Okay, so I had to grow up just a little bit, all right? So don't, please, please. You know, when we get out of SEAL teams, man, God shuts that book on us. <laughs> uh, so, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, no. so we we're, were in breakout, you know, and uh, you know, for those who don't know, breakout is when Hell Week starts, and you're not supposed to know about it, but I, I kind of had a clue, and uh, you, you're not told it's going to happen between midnight and whatever, and next thing you know, you're trying to sleep, but... Hell week starts, and all of a sudden you hear explosions and machine gun fire. And for us, they came right into your room, yeah, and, man, check. and you hear uh, my my uh, the, the head of the trainers was uh, Senior Chief Nepper, a wonderful Vietnam veteran again, and he, they're giving you instructions. Of course, you can't hear the instructions. They make sure you can't, and, they, and then if you think you can hear them, they give you silly instructions. So you're bound to fail no matter how. Yeah, they're and like, hey, get, go right. And they'll point with their left hand exactly. like that, dude. Like and, a magician. Like a magician. Yep. And then you see guys you hadn't seen before, which is terrifying because yep. they're pissed. Yep. That oh, is correct. Oh, and, and you're like, it, anything you knew, like even I did, I'm think I'm double guessing it now. Well, maybe I was wrong and maybe we fucked up here. And, and so I just remember us being in one of those times when you're kind of in the PT thing and they're walking around the whole garden hoses in your face. You're already cold. You're soaking wet. Uh, flashbangs are going off right around you. Sometimes on you, the the brass casings from the M60s are going down your neck and burning you. And, and I'm right next to our class leader, and we're just laughing. We're laughing. And and it, it, an instructor will come down there, and he'll yell at you. But I remember one time in particular, they have the travel bell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The bell that can be it's moved around. Moved. And put that bell right in front of you. Hey, Karachi, what, what are bring you, it to you doing this? This is so stupid. Just ring the bell. Be warm. Get something to eat. And and he did it between me and, and my class leader. Let's just say his name is Neil. And I looked at him because, you know, these guys are four years older than me. I went to college. They taught yeah. me a lot. I, I never swam in cold water before. And they taught me a lot of stuff. And, and we just looked at each other and laughed. And, and the instructors, they take the bell right away from us. And you could see them smirk. Yeah. But their smirk was... We want those guys to pass. So that's what we wanted, but we're not going to tell them we're happy about it. And God, you know, brilliant at that. What was important about that was years later, I uh, I left the team thirty days before this happened, and and that the only thing I would have changed in my life, but that was the first mission that the special team had, and it didn't go well for a lot of guys. God bless them. So they jump into Grenada. My class leader, my friend, remember, we were right together during that hell week. What happens is, I'm not there, so I can't tell you for sure, but the guys all told me, the sea levels were beyond comprehension. And I think if- I've always heard that. If you talk to any good frogman, it's hard for us to imagine drowning. But we all come close at some time or another. Or I've done it, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and I have too. I was knocked yeah. unconscious. I, I think every frogman has drowned at least once or twice. I believe that's true. Because when they say that that scary cease, that really doesn't mean anything to us. Like, I think we're going. We're, we got to go anyways. You don't. I I often think about it today because I think if I ever come up with something like dementia, I hope I'm brave enough to identify it and go for a long swim. Swim. That's where I want to be. Just yep. Go fishing, man. Yep. I know a lot of guys that talk about that that, that long fishing trip. I I, I get that. I don't know why, but I've often said that to people. Is it the frogman or the guy that wanted to be a frogman? Mm. Because I think we are who we are before that. Otherwise, why would you do it? Why, why would you do it? Yep. I so, get that question real. You understand that question real well when you get later down the line. Like, why in the hell would you do that? And there's the thing. That, <laughs> that, that's a problem because it's not my age. It's, it's my mileage, my, right? Yeah. It's time to elevate your confidence from the boardroom to the bedroom with hymns. Whether you're making your power moves in the office, enjoying a fine dinner at night, or you're hitting the gym hard, hymns ensures that you are always at your best. Hymns is your ultimate game changer, providing affordable and discreet access to essential treatments. You can forget about the hassle of awkward doctor's visits because with hymns, it's all about easy online solutions to a pretty common issue. Ready to maintain that confidence day and night? 
Begin your free online visit today at hymns.com slash TNQ. Explore personalized treatment options at hymns.com slash TNQ now. And remember, prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider. Restrictions apply. Go visit the website for details and safety information. Subscription is required and prices may vary based on product and plan. Remember, it is HIMS.com slash TNQ. So my uh, my friend, my class leader, was on that stick where everyone drowned. Only two guys survived. One that actually hit the rubber duck. How? It's amazing, right? I don't know this story. Can you tell us for the listeners exactly what happened? Well, I, 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 only as an outsider and the mm-hmm. guys telling me, but the guys jumped and uh, initially they were told, how, how reminiscent is this of D-Day? They were told that it was going to be low resistance, everything was a good deal, and then midway, I guess, they were told that, no, pack on more gear. So the guys wanted more ammo, and in battle, you know, you learn one thing. Uh, All the other stuff isn't important. Water, especially for desert guys, and ammunition, that's what you need. Anyway, the guys loaded up heavy, and when they jumped, the sea states, sea conditions were beyond comprehension. And, and for people that don't understand what that means is, and for me, uh, and I spent a lot of time in South Florida, and you, you see the seas from a hurricane. So you, you've got swells that are beyond what you can measure. So let's say they could be anywhere from 10 feet to 50 feet. That's crests and troughs. But beyond that, you have wind, and wind is frothing up the water. So now, okay, you can float, sure, but you can't breathe. Even though you're on the surface, you can't breathe. Wherever you turn your head, you're going to get froth. Yeah, get slapped. So here you are now. It's dark. Uh, they did everything right. You know, there's a lot. We, we have SOPs that we live by. We never drop our fins until you hit the water. Guys, should, and they, they used to do that, and they misjudged the water, and, uh, and they cut away too soon, and now, you know, it's a 100-foot fall. That's like hitting concrete. They did everything right. So Neil does everything right. He... Uh, He's in the water, and now what happens is um, they were jumping squares, though. They weren't jumping around. Uh, Six six, uh, had had the squares then. Really, in those days, they were... Talking about parachute design. They were so cool. Uh, We had technology that today you guys look at and say, really, you think that's cool? They had little cards that were lights. They weren't even LEDs. I don't know how they did it. But anyway, uh, when you hit the water, you only got a matter of minutes, and if that parachute gets saturated... Well, it's an anchor. You're going down. Mm -hmm. End of story. When we all taught, you know, when you hit the water, if you've got your chute, reach back as far as you can, grab a handful, pull it in front of you. And if you just keep doing that, you'll get the chute over your head and you'll be free. Well, he cut away the chute. So that should have been great, but the wind blew it right on his head anyway. Mm -hmm. So So now he's reaching back and he pulls fabric over, but the wind and the water keeps blowing it back on him. It's not working. Shoot saturated. He's gone. He's underwater now. That shoots all over him. And he told me. He said, I conceded the death. It was I couldn't get it. I'm sinking. And he shoots over me. And he said, at that point, just, I didn't make it. And then as he's sinking, he was thinking about Hell Week. And he was thinking about that day that they rang the bell in front of him. And told me, I realized that that's what it was all about, not quitting. You know, team never quit. If you never quit, you'll never know how to. And it was at that moment that he said, no, no. Like someone else I know sitting across from me that had to say to himself, I am not going to let it take me. I am going to fight. So he started the same procedure, moving the fabric over his head. But this time, he's underwater. So the conditions weren't affecting him the same way. He got the fabric over his head, and he made it to the surface. Mm. And he is the only one that survived outside of the kid that hit the rubber duck. Mm. And he's always been an example to me. I'm sure I annoyed a lot of people when I left six. You know, when you become a frogman, that's a career move. Yeah. And, and I was supposed to do that. 
And I'm sure that's why, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, bonds, you know, but most guys, especially if you hit the special team in those days, you stay in. But yeah. anyway, the story was about that. Can you imagine? That is so, so that scary. one that one incident in Buzz, specifically in Hell Week, that saved his life. Wow! I'm not the only gonna... reason I knew I could make it is because I had made it through Hell Week. Like I kept telling myself that. I was like I, I've been here, but it was di- you know it was just different. It was different, and I thought Hell Week sucked worse. <laughs> You know, team guys get into everything. Right? That's the best part about bringing y'all on and hearing the stories about it is like each guy has to, has this freaking thing that happens to them their, when your they're own in. Perspective, yeah. yeah. So you, when you're with, when they move us around like they do, when you patch up with somebody, it's like most of us hear the stories too. Like, do you hear what that guy had to go through? Is he still alive? Yes. Oh yeah. No, I, I I'm probably shouldn't say he'd be embarrassed, but years ago, uh, my other. Uh, good friend that was second to the class leader he's a character in himself he left the navy and he got a job with a, a three-letter agency and he decided to leave and i said you know why did you leave and he said ah they were all pinheads yeah and the next thing you know he got got he was in uh uh dea quantico and then he decided to pull the plug and he ended up going back in the navy he retired with a full bird they wanted him to have a star, oh, man. but he said, Those no. freaking guys. He said, I'm done. I'm done. You don't hear about the, they're like, yeah, I did 20-something years, retired as a captain or admiral. But you don't realize that they had two, three other careers in front of that. That's true. Well, he some called the, me one some day. Some of them, man. He called me one day and he said, hey, that man Neil is retiring and uh, they want to do a special thing and they wanted some photographs of his navy days and i'm pretty sure you have some more than i and i said sure so i sent him in uh he believe it or not was the ceo of one of the biggest telecom companies in the country good for him that's what i try and tell people man our community is so broad the, the our fraternity we just you know some people he was a great guy. I, I ran into him several times when I still had a badge, and he was he was working with a company guy in uh, K&R, uh, kidnap and uh, ransom stuff in South America, and he ended up working for a, a big pastry company, believe it or not, and involved in a director of security, and then next thing I knew, I, I, was, I was talking to his good friend, my other lieutenant, and it, it, he's the CEO where? Yeah. And so, you just, you, you sit back and you got to be proud. I'm so proud. And, you know, he had a couple of great kids because we need that today, yeah. you know. And, and I, I, I saw that a lot in law enforcement, you know, where you, you, you just don't have parents that take the responsibility to raise the kids. And I hate to say it, a large part it's not the kid's fault, but then again comes a point in life where. Oh, eventually it is. You got to wake up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. That, that, that well, was, yeah, yeah, you got to have both. Dad gives you discipline. Your mom gives you manners. Send that sucker out to, you know, hanging out with other kids like that molds all that into place. Well, you guys need to have more kids. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> and, and I say that not because I want to talk. Oh, our kids because... are great. I got luck, man. Well, yeah, they got a great mom. I got a great assignment. It was, it was, this is awesome. <laughs> so when you, when you graduated, Buds, were, were your brother, were you all on the same team or did they switch? No, no, you know. Coast? In, in those days, uh, there's a lot, and we were talking earlier today about that too. There, there's a lot about buds that we're never privy to, and there's a reason for that. And I learned later on, like we were talking, I was with, uh, I'm, I'm with Mr. Marcinko, the, the founder of Six, and he, Richard Marcinko. It goes yep. by Dick, yep. Big Skipper, Seal, Seal Team Six, Red Cell guy. Kind of wrote the book Rogue Warrior. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. We're we're doing a contract that he generated for uh, Eastern Michigan University, and we're sitting in front of a class, and um, somebody, one of the students, asked him a question, and the bottom line was, you know, do do you guys do this and do that and buds and, and what Dick said is, well, we want the guys to know enough. So they, they can su- successfully navigate buds. But we don't tell them everything. One, they certainly couldn't absorb everything at that time. But two, if we're very strategic about how we're going to instruct them and what we're going to teach them, but yet 
it's it's enough, but it's not enough, then those that succeed and those that even do better demonstrate an in, an internal ability that they already had. And so the science behind it was the reason they don't give us, in my day, more psychological techniques and even maybe some physical, uh, phys physiological tricks. They want to see who's going to do it on their own. And therefore, that inherent skill, those are the guys that will probably be groomed yeah, yeah. for it advancing into other things. A lot of guys will be frogmen, but that, that's it. They won't be thought of or groomed to do something special. So for instance, and that's why I brought it up in my buds class, um, well, there are only two SEAL teams. Yeah. So you got one SEAL team in San Diego, one SEAL team in Norfolk, Virginia. I apologize to anyone that I have offended there. All the West Coast guys pick on the East Coast dudes. I, I, hey, don't worry. I'm, I'm right there with you. And I know you're an East, East Coast frog. No, I'm not. I'm West. My was brother went over there. Oh, okay. There it was. Yeah. It was hey, well, they, they, people, Marcus was augmented with 10. He was SDV. Yeah, when excuse Redmond me. I was special down. deliveries. So I went to yeah. special yes. deliveries first. And then that's when I got assigned to 10. But I'm a Westie. Got it, got it. Well, I mean, I, so there you go. Real proud about that West Coast thing. So, so let's say. And I never made it to six. I only made it to five. That, that's what I like telling people. That, that, that <laughs> you, you, you've got 23 guys now that are graduating. There's only two SEAL teams. Everybody wants to go to SEAL team. No one wants to go to UDT. Because they were still around. They were sw we were still cut in half. Yep. And, and the reason for that is for, for listeners is in, in those days, Everybody has to go overseas. Everybody has to do their tours, but UDT had to do it on ship. Oh. And and they have to be on ship. That was a game changer back then. Yeah. Game changer now yeah. when we hear that. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we're still in the Navy. We're supposed to be sailors. Spr and that's exactly what they say to us. Right. When, they, when they stick our right. asses on those submarines and on those boats, they're like, bottom line, your ass belongs to the Navy. When right. did that change? When did UDT phase out? Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember, but it was... When was the only astronaut stuff was going down, right? In the 70s? Six, late 60s? Well, no, because he went... He early was in 80s. 79. I think early 80s, they started to decommission and change them. But the point there was... What do you think? Everybody's going to want to pick SEAL Team 1. No one wants to go to Virginia when you can be in San Diego. And so uh, they only picked two guys. Went to one out of my class, and it was the Iron Man, or whatever we call him, class, uh, you know, valedictorian, yeah, if badass. you will, and me. And uh, a couple guys, uh, I think six, went to two, and then everybody else got split up into UDT teams. Really? Yep. My brother... Uh, we were very different physically too. He's short, squatty. He can't touch a weight; otherwise, he'll, muscles will just be muscles on top of muscles. When he swam, he oh. left a wake in the water. Roger that. I know what you're saying. And so he he went to UDT, and uh, but he went to UDT 11. So we were we were both on the same coast. We never really operated together, but he ended up doing a tour with the jump team. Yeah. Oh, he's a leapfrog. Yeah. Nice. And, and so I, uh, SEAL Team One, had just started in school free fall. Yeah, training. So I did my free fall there, and so we we did we got to jump together a little bit, but free fall. Okay, this was something that I don't know. It, it, it's it, it it demonstrates more about the individual. Okay, uh, like you know, what was more important, a guy that was a seal or a guy that wanted to be a seal? I mean, obviously you've got to accomplish it, but so anyway. You got to look at it this way. Free fall is difficult because there's no gravity. So you're jumping out of an airplane, or in this case, a chopper for our first jumps, and you got to control your legs. But most people don't feel these things. I've been fighting uh, martial arts and stuff as well as wrestling as a little kid forever. So part of that is knowing that your body's made up of multiple weapons. Anyway, the reason I bring that up is they spend. Uh, a, a good amount of time on what we call dirt diving and understanding what you're going to do on the ground. Visualizing and walking through it before we go do it. Absolutely. Well, talking about what's going to happen in the air, still, you just can't explain it. It's completely uh, different when they take your ass off the earth. That's right. 
Now, now today, you know, people, th- there was a thing called advanced free fall, which they did later, and now they have all kinds of technology, but it was just that. You get told what to do, and then boom, you're out of the plane. That fast. That's fast. I remember they had a little roller table that we got to sit on our ch- on our chests and bellies, and they would kind of spin it That's around with their hands. very cool. And they were like, this is kind of what it's like. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It wasn't. If you could find the video of my first five jumps out of a free fall, it looked like God reached in the plane and grabbed me by the foot and side-armed my big ass down to go. the earth. I mean, my even my instructors were like, I've never seen anything like this. My brother's a sky god. I mean, he he, he flies, sits around me, and he can fly around. I look like the greatest American hero. Remember that show when that dude I tried do. to fly? I do. That's what my ass looks yep. like on a parachute. Well, you're not alone. Lot, uh, that happened and I don't know why it's like that. It just is. Well, so for me, I got in trouble again. And, and it's funny. Last time I got in trouble was with that same guy I told you about that survived Grenada. And we were, we were at the special team playing. Anyway, the point was... I just listened to my chief. My, my chief was an air god. He was on Leapfrogs too, uh, a wonderful guy. He, uh, half Filipino, half American, funniest friggin' guy in the world. He, uh, I was the biggest pain in his ass so many times because I, you know, a little bit of knowledge for me went a long way. And I, <laughs> I remember static. That's a good way to say that. Well, I've I, never I heard should. it like that. I, I'm not steal that. It's funny. Oh, yeah, it's, it's true for me. I, you know, I, I remember we got in a big argument. We were, we were static line jumping, and I wanted my, my knife here, and he kept telling me it shouldn't be there. And, and uh, you know, it was just an example of, I didn't have enough people telling me, hey, kid, you got two ears and one mouth. Keep your fucking mouth shut. Wow, dude, I got told that all the time, too, and I couldn't. Well, fortunately. I say he beat that into me. Like, he actually had to whip my ass a couple times, man. Well, I, I guarantee you this, though. If you were going to do something that really would have been dangerous to yourself, they would have just said, hey, I'm you your know how chief. team guys this. are. They'd be like, I told you. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think about those guys. In, you know, we have the ones that are loud and boisterous and get, get rowdy, and then we have the freaking stoic. Yep. Like, they can just yep. say yep. something yep. to yep. you, man. I mean, seals come in all wrapped in everything. Yep. Well, I remember, you know, for me, I, I still had – uh, all, all the Vietnam veterans walking around. Oh, almost, I can't even imagine what that was like. Almost every guy had a story from a UDT guy named Happy Baker that was part of the first one of the SEAL squads that ambushed another SEAL squad oh, yeah. by accident. And the yeah, only yeah, reason yeah. they knew what happened was because the other guys were shooting stoner and no one else had stoner. No one had one, yeah. Dude. And then we had another guy, I forget, who, uh, who definitely didn't clear the static line properly and the static line ripped his bicep right off. <gasps> And then I remember Mac McCarthy, who Senior chief? might have been at that time, but I think he was still younger then. He's instructor, talking about. He got blown up pretty yeah. good in Vietnam. But Mac, I'd look at these guys, though, and each guy was a different lesson to remember. And Mac, uh, his head was a little funny. He was missing a part, and, and they had to rebuild it. He had he, he one of the grenades he was wearing got shot. Oh gosh! On his belt, he had him forward. Oh, I've heard that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and and, and that was part of him. And then you see guys, you know, that have wounds from a fifty. Cal- well, the Soviets had a fifty-one caliber, whatever. Where you just you can't replace that flesh. Yeah. And not all of those were lessons. Some of those were. That's the way it is. Yeah. You could no matter how good you're you're doing that 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 can happen. But. Um, I lost my track again. Well, oh. when you were about to jump, your knife was oh, on one is, side. So, I don't know, guys. I was talking to Mark yesterday. One of the things that I love about you, too, and I said this to Marcus, is that I've always found life really boring. <laughs> and in the teams, it was, I don't know, I guess it was a gift for me. But you're supposed to be scared when you jump out of a plane at first. I got to be honest with you, maybe I'm the crazy guy. Because remember they say, you know, you're either scared or you're crazy. I just did everything Chief said. I came out of that chopper. I held my position. Boom, I'm stable. Most people, they come out and you almost, it's so hard to hold, but your butt's going to come over. You're, the lower center of gravity will fall. I just held it the way he said. I came out stable. And I said, okay, that was easy. Now what? And then I went into the tracking formation. Yeah. 
So now I'm thinking, this is cool. So I'm holding a max track, which means you're falling at terminal velocity almost at a 45 degree angle. Without a, we didn't have flight suits then. Well, the problem was- What are you was, jumping in? They were like- uh, It's like UDT with the old ball and boys hanging out and just flapping pi on the pilot way? Pilot shoot, pilot- uh, oh, oh, coveralls. Yeah. Oh, check, right yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm tracking across the sky. Well, the problem is Chief, who's our, our you know former leapfrog, and his name was Cobber, by the way, so we call him K-Bar. He also had a brother, and teens, by the way, younger. Well, K-Bar, he's flying to help all the other guys who are unstable, get them stable and make sure they're going to pull. We did have some mechanism that would pull altitude-oriented, right. but that was it. And he'd make sure, and here I am tracking, and he thought I was out of control because I was tracking. Even though I was holding position, he thought that I was going to just you know, crash into the earth. But he couldn't get to me because I was, boom, zooming out. Well, he was pissed. And he saved everybody, and we got to the ground, and, of course, that was... That happened quite a few times for some reason whenever I'd land after parachute, and I got yelled at for one thing or another. <laughs> but he came up and gave me the ninth degree, and I said, Chief, I did what you told me to do, and it was so easy. I wanted to try something else. I don't know what it was oh when I would hear, hear about the jump two days before my hands would start sweating. And my goggles always froze up. I couldn't. They always fogged up real bad. And, and the thing about being the jump is that there's always somebody in there cutting up. Oh, yeah. Like oh, little, yeah. little pull your pin out of your shoe oh, and put it back man. in. You can't help it. Like, team guys can't help that. I always banked the fact that my Odyssey would blow at 1,500 feet if I just got too far out of control. That, that's never the forget. mechanism that the, keeps your Yeah, the, the reserve. There, we have a mechanism that if team guys get too far out of whack, that some bitch will blow. Yep. And uh, I remember in jump school, my, my instructor, he was, I could hear him laughing at me when we were falling. And I look over at him as I'm in a flat spin because I tried to arrow out, dude, and I started flat spin. He was just kind of shaking his head. He's like, you're amazing, man. <laughs> and I'm trying real hard. Like <laughs> In those moments when, I'm, when I get nervous, I try real hard. I think they could tell. It's still the funniest thing ever. I mean, they just, how could they not think that was funny? It's like throwing a cat out of that, the plane? Worse, yes, because I make some noise <laughs> the cat can't. Well, remember, too, one of the things that Marcus is explaining, and, and it's very vivid to me, is... You're in a in a military jump. We have to jump as close together as we can. Now you, you have static line and, and you have free fallers. You know when we jump with squares later, but you still did one thing together. You get up in line and you examine each other's equipment to make sure the guy's squared away and nothing bad's going to happen. And and then when you're wearing a square, that included opening the flaps, make sure the pins were connected. And, uh, and we trust each other. And, and absolutely. And that was the first thing you do. That's where you try to scare the shit, scare out, shit out of in front of you first time. And Trust you, is not always a good thing. <laughs> there you go. You I mean, because there's it. levels that go with got team guys, and we got some guys that like, you can't believe. If they know you, they love you, and you but love each other, then you jump with a... Yeah, whatever. Well, so you if, don't even if, know. If I'm behind Marcus... I'm checking his stuff, and I don't care if it's good or not. I'm shaking his legs. It's, it's getting in here. I that's mean, that's little, what it's all about. That's a little loose there, man, Marcus. I don't know. That doesn't look good, man. And then I'll check his pin. I say, man, that freaking pin looks like it's bent. I'm not even sure if it's... But it's okay, I think. Oh, my god! I would go with it, but I don't... I well, man, well, it's too late now. And then another guy will see that's happening, and he'll chime in. He'll kind of come in. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, but like real stoic. Like, oh, you know? my yeah, should, should we stop? Man, stop we should him? probably call the guy, you know, and we'll start getting on. This is right in the beginning. And it would Can happen. Can you say, there. okay, I'm not Can't do jump. anything. Oh, no, we don't do that. And then in the you end, it was always. In. You're freaking going. Ah, fuck it. I jump it. I jump it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, then they bait you with that. <laughs> what are you, a pussy? You know, that kind of whole night. You're like, oh, man, no. All right, I'll go. I'll hey, go. The, the I'll veteran go. guys, they did this one to me. Well, I didn't pack it. What's his name? <laughs> oh, I don't no. know. Oh, my I mean, you always pack your, pack your own shoe. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, That's absolutely. Crazy. Good one. Good one. I loved it. Okay, so when you when you transitioned out of the, out of the teams, you went to law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, real quick, where, you, was the time frame when you were in the teams, is that when they set up Red Cell? No, no, no. That was a whole different ball game. Uh, I, uh, the funny thing there was, um, you know, I, I, I loved understanding everything. And so I made sure I understood the history of the teams. And uh, I was very proud that John F. Kennedy and the chief of Navy operations in those days were the ones that decided to have a SEAL team. And, 
you know, uh, regardless of politics, why? Why was I a Kennedy fan? Well, in case people don't remember, John F. Kennedy was a lieutenant in the Navy. And not only that, he served as a patrol boat captain, which were sitting ducks in the water. And PT-109 was cut in half, and he saved his crew after a long time. And I'm telling you, folks, it, it's hard to explain to people that aren't in the military how He's much the one that, that set means us free. to us. John's the one that set us free. That's right. And and, and, and I'll tell you what, I, I I just can't say enough about the man. We don't talk about him enough, man. And, and I, will always, I always carry, you know, a 50-cent piece with me along with my uh, now a challenge coin. I mean, challenge coins weren't big when I was in. They are now. But they are now. But I had a, I had JFK's coin, and I always will. Uh, so, so that was important to me. But I'm not really sure I want to say this because you never talk about dirty laundry unless you're with SEALs. So let me just say this. One of the reasons that I was really driven to, to, to be a frogman was because they weren't designed for any other purpose other than warfare. And so I felt that was an opportunity to, to fight for people that couldn't fight for themselves. And believe it or not, when I was a kid, and this is a true story, I... Uh, I thought, what, what is the epitome of evil? What would you fight? And in those days, there was a movie that came out uh, called The Exorcist. Hmm. That one got me. And I wonder, is that true? Is that not true? And if it was, there's no greater direct confrontation than a fight with that level of evil. And there happened to be a monastery near our, our hometown, uh, self-serving. It was really cool. Every now and then you go up there and they had the stereotypical great big monk with an eye patch who was ringing the bell. Ah. But for some reason, my parents... Is that true? Me, true. A true, true. My parents wanted me and they talked to him. And they said, our boy wants to, thinks he can th th be a priest and be an exorcist. And, and he sat me down and he said, I'm going to tell you one thing I want you to know more importantly than anything. You study about the good first, and you study about Catholicism and all of that before you ever think about anything learning evil. And as cool as that was, eh, there didn't register <laughs> with me again because I went. We did the evil route first. Yeah, I, I got that. Right. Yeah, went down to the dark side of the forest in the beginning. They, totally didn't listen. Uh, I, boy, didn't I make that yeah, mistake yeah. a million times. And uh, again, I went off track on why I told you that story, but there, that was part of why I went in the teams. And what happened was, remember, I'm surrounded by Vietnam veterans, and every now and then somebody told me a story. It was a story about war, and, and it was a story that talked about struggle that happened to some people in a war. And Vietnam was a very, very difficult war. Uh, it was difficult in so many ways, but m mostly because... Can you imagine, can you imagine, and this is one of the stories that hit me hard, can you imagine being a frogman? Now, you know, we, we choose our military because they're young, so that they can recover physically, but also because they're malleable. We can tell them, you know, that we're doing this f for the right reasons. And can you imagine that in Vietnam, you have a man that's been a farmer all his life, that's all he knows. Mm -hmm. He's he's planting rice and he's he's making a living for his family, and the country's in turmoil politically. But it doesn't register to him. He lives in the country. He just makes rice, and next thing you know, the communists come to him or people of another political stance, if you will, and well, you're going to give us that rice. And by the way, you need to hold these guns for us or something like that. He doesn't know any better because if he doesn't do that, they're going to kill his family. Now the Americans come in and say, hey, uh, don't do that, and we'll protect you. But can we? Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, what does a guy do? He does what he has to do to survive. But that also makes him a target. Uh -huh. What an impossible situation to be in. And tactically, if you look at it as a purist, he has to be removed. But if you look at it, I don't know. As a human, I would have found that hard if someone told me I had to kill that guy. 
And I know some people had to. And that and a few other stories of something that bad that might have happened really affected me. And I, I thought about, you know, I want to go after bad guys, but that doesn't sound like it's as clear cut as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. And therein lies the rub. But, you know, when you're in the military, first of all, you're young. You shouldn't be thinking that way. Right. You should be thinking that I will follow all the orders. That's a good soldier. That's what they say. I already told you. I was never that person. Mm-hmm. And maybe somebody should have told me, you know, yeah, you can go in the military, but listen, this is how. All right, let's talk about the game changer that every business needs. The secret weapon that has been right here at the helm of the TNQ online shop, Shopify. Shopify isn't just another platform. It's the turbo boost behind countless thriving businesses worldwide, just ensuring everybody's running like a well-oiled machine. And whether you're just stepping out in the e-commerce arena for the first time, you're expanding to physical stores, or you're hitting that sweet million dollar mark, Shopify is your steadfast partner through all of it. From selling trendy tees to posters to dominating the service industry, it doesn't really matter what you do with Shopify's flexibility and seamless POS system. They've got you covered through all of it. But you want to know what really makes Shopify stand out? Okay, so imagine their checkout as the LeBron James of the internet. Skyrocketing sales by 36% compared to any other platform. This is easily my favorite feature from them because what they do is they're just so successful at it. You really can't beat it. If you're ready to take your business to the next level, score a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash TNQ. When it comes to growth and success, Shopify is your slam dunk. Remember, with Shopify, you're not just a business owner, you're a champion of your industry. Experience the difference at shopify.com slash TNQ. So that weighed heavily on me. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, I'm never, I was never put in a position to do something that I didn't feel was right and I didn't have to carry that weight but it always worried me what would I do if I was put in that position and thank God rumors of SEAL Team started to come up and this was a team that was going to be created for a role of anti-terrorism a term that really wasn't that well known at that time and I found it to be very interesting and I, I looked into it more because it was still it was very, even within the commands and community, it was a hush-hush thing. And uh, that team was started in 1980. I was brand new to the teams, but the first time it was kind of like a traveling road show. They would have interviews and if you were interested in SEAL Team, shh, you could go to the interview. Well, here I am. I'm standing in line to go to the interview. And guys around me have personnel jackets like old yellow pages. You know, these are all Vietnam vets. And I barely got two pieces of paper in a manila folder. But I'm going anyway. And now it's my turn. And I poke my head in the door. And I see this guy with long hair, full beard, sitting behind a desk. He's got a vest on, a three-piece suit. And I look over here, and there's this guy with long hair, look like Edgar Winter in the other corner. And I'm thinking, oh, excuse me, I must be in the wrong room. And then I hear, fuck you, Karachi. You're in the right room. <laughs> That's what you want to hear. That was my first meeting with, with the founder and the commander, Richard Marcy. Oh. And, I, I, come here. and I stepped in front of the desk, and you know what? He knew everything about me in high school. He knew about lacrosse. He knew about all the times I wrestled and that I was a martial artist. A, a quote, just a fighter, really. And, uh, and he said to me, he goes, look, why do you want to come here? What do you know about the team first? I told him what I thought I knew. And he said, most of that is accurate. Uh, why do you want to come here? I explained to him just what I told you guys about something that I never thought about before that might be a challenge to me, you know, uh, inside. And he told me what the team was, and he told me what he was going to do. And the other thing that bothered me was I wanted to do. 
what we do. Well, I was a Cold War frogman, and that's pretty tough to be a war machine in Cold War. That doesn't make any sense. The hardest on our guys. I was talking to some of the young ones earlier mm-hmm. in the week, and they, you can see it in their face. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is hard. You're a war veteran. You went in the teams and did what you're supposed to do. Well, you, you did a lot more than that, but... That's why I'm adamant about telling them Th- that's, the, that's, that hunger. That's, I get. I remember that. We want to do that, and there's so many Cold War frogmen that were always ready. We went in ready. There was no war, but we were ready. And it just never happened, and it's 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 tough. It's very tough to train, 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 and never do the job. And it was not only that, but Mr. Marcinko said, look, you're going to be everywhere it's going on. We're going to be there as instructors, observers, but you'll be involved. You might be wearing another country's uniform, but you're going to be involved. And I was like, holy shit, that's the answer to my dreams. I, I mean, know, God. I, I, I thought Very I was Very rarely stuck. does anybody get to sit in an interview when the boss actually says something cool like that. <laughs> and then he says... You, you know what I'm talking about? Like when they're, when they're, when they're throwing out the, res- the, the it brochure, a- and it's like, that's, that's what I need to hear right there, man. And I... It, even at the, you know, the fact that some people may may take great offense to this, I was a bit distraught if I was told to kill this farmer, mm-hmm. and now here was a man telling me, "No, you're going to be in a different place, and it's going to be very purposeful." And 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 I, you know, I don't want to say too much more. It was wrong, but then he proceeded to say. But I know where you're going next, and you need to make that trip. And after that, if you want to come back, I'll take you. Now, remember, the, he's taking the cream of the teams, and these are all war veterans if you can get them. There were uh, quite a few guys that weren't at one point, but still. And what he alluded to was something else that's special about the teams. So at this time, there was a fella in North Africa that was acting a fool. And SEAL Team was putting a platoon together that quite possibly was going to be the first Desert War platoon. I ended up writing a chapter in a book a long time ago I was very proud of called Men Under Pressure. It was about this whole period. And what's really beautiful and unique about SEAL Team is they are now putting together a platoon that might possibly see the first war since Vietnam. So the officer in charge has to be very experienced. Officer in charge in these days, former enlisted man, now Lieutenant R.J. Thomas, arguably one of the finest shooter SEAL teams ever produced, and quite a record in Vietnam. Mr. Thomas was the kind of guy that uh, you either liked him or you hated him, To say he was opinionated was an understatement, but he earned every bit of it. So there you go. Now, that's your most experienced guy. Chief was experienced, but kind of new. And then your first class, who was a wonderful guy, uh, was was killed, I understand, in the private sector. But he was a PT machine, and, and, and afterwards I... I always hated that. I was such a smart ass, and I'd always pick on him, but when I heard he passed away, I was so sorry I couldn't tell him how much I respected him, a guy named Dave Laconte. So bottom line is what I'm trying to tell you is that platoon was made up of brand new people and veterans, brand new people and veterans, to make sure that we would be okay, but the new guys would learn the way. We still stack like that. Mm-hmm. And that, again, is one of the beauties of the teams and the secrets because they know we have to prepare these people. We train the young guys as good as we can, but they still have to mix it up to really know yeah. when they do it. And then people ask, do we have platoons that they stack deep? With get- yeah, we got that too. Yep. I mean, we if, if we can mix it up anyway, we, we, we do it. And, and most everyone in the teams, you hear about it, you know about it. If you're not privy to it, you can witness it, you can see it when it goes down, and then we have our own way of noticing. And that's, that, that's brilliant. And they do it. Um, at, at any rate, uh, and that that uh, deployment took a little extra time. And there was a, a fella who was big wheel in the Navy, I, I mean in the Marine Corps, who was part of organizing these things. Really can't say much except his last name was a major compass heading. And he was a proponent of the teams. And we were supposed to uh, 
do something special in this mission. In the end, they felt it was too risky, I think, and they uh, they they went a different way with technology. But we're still there, and we we did some. We always will do training or something to kind of mask why we're in that yeah. part of the country, and and the mission went well. And that particular guy, uh, his name is <laughs> uh, <laughs> The airstrike was such that he decided not to screw with us anymore. You know, uh, but. Uh, most of the time in, for me, um, was like that. I, I had one other time I wanted to tell you about that I, I acted a fool again. We were back in a truck, and it was three frogmen, my, my chief again, who was, I, I can't say enough about him. We had some great people in teams like you did, though. And and uh, remember, we're, we're putting our life on the line. I, I had great chiefs. I got lucky. Mm-hmm. There you go. How, I mean, how, how do you how do you motivate a guy to go in the battle to risk his life like that and a kid you know so you've got to have brilliant people I was and chiefs got to be training. locked on yeah like the 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 LPO he runs it the chief's in charge and the officer's responsible so when that and let me tell you something about those anchors now, the senior chiefs hold rank and the master chief but that one that that seven that freaking chief runs the show you screw around one of them and they'll end your life he's the glue. Man, they, yeah, They're, and when you got a good one, God dang, man. Well, I'm very fortunate too. We had some great people there, but they still. You go back to imagine. I, I, I do this because I always carry a little stone in my pocket, and that that stone just looks like any other stone. It's 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 red, a lot of iron in it, reddish, and there's actually some some fades of red. And I never tell anybody where the stone came from until I tell them the story. But imagine our brothers, our forefathers, that were the engineers in D-Day that had to swim in God, the dude. naked warriors and blow obstacles under that fire. Maybe the Germans didn't rain it down on them because they didn't want to give away that they were there, but still they were out there doing this. And and then you got to think about the guys that are in the landing craft and in the first wave, why... They were told that, you know, we bombed the crap bombed out of the, the shit beach. out of it. They said it was, yeah. We no resistance. It. You're going to be good to go. Right. And then we lost 95% of that first wave. Now you're the second wave. Well, how the hell do you motivate a guy in the second wave that you got to go on the beach? Mm-hmm. Now that's Saving Private Ryan opening scene? Basically. When I mean, think about just rolling up on there and just dropping the gate down and they're, they're parked. At, we didn't touch them. Come to find out. And they were waiting on us, and we got there, man. And they put a freak out, oh, dude. That, That's like. That story in itself is probably one of the most intense. So you take that back, and you talk to a frogman, and you know that every one of our missions often are like that. We're outnumbered. Yeah. How do you mo- motivate people to go there? And that stone always reminds me. Because that stone is from Normandy, and it's not just from the beach on Normandy. It's from our beach, Omaha, Mm. which was, as we now know, the worst. Uh, Utah had shells. It was almost, I forget, more than a mile away, but I didn't know it at the time, but that stone was uh, indigenous to Omaha, so much so that the first time I was at the cemetery in Normandy, they have a statue of a young man coming out of the water to symbolize the allies, mostly the Americans, that were young, that gave their life for those people. But impregnated in the concrete at the base of the statue are these stones. See, we do need to go, babe. Yeah. The 80th anniversary. We're stone. talking about going in oh, June. You, yeah, you, no, you have to. Okay. You have to. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's for, for us... It's an absolute. I uh, I was there providing private security my first time, and uh, I was just so happy that the uh, the gentleman I was working for, was a wonderful man, wanted to spend time there and allowed me my own time there. It's difficult to talk about. Sure. Yeah. I remember doing. We had to blow the the, the in third phase to re- reenact that that whole evolution, blow all that stuff up underneath water. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I was good at in the team is I'm good in the water. And that, that was a tough evolution. 
to get down there. So imagine doing that in real life and when they were having to go in there and do all that under fire. And I dislocated my shoulder the first time doing that. You, you go down there and you're tying those haversacks on. You use all your air and you pull up to get that air. Next thing you know, you get hit by a wave. wave. Yep. Bust you right in the face. Yep. And that's what happened. I pulled so hard and my arm got contorted. And, and then I ended up getting knocked out on the beach. I guess the sea states were high that day. Oh. But so, still, how, how do you, and, and so we boil that down and that's for another time, but I, we have a technique now where we help people understand how to use their mind to overcome what their body Oh, all that's be. advanced. Yep. I was talking to a guy. That's one, absolutely right. One of the doctors, Dr. Eric Potterat, he, he, he spent a, an extensive amount of time in our communities and cultivated all that. All that stuff we were talking about earlier where they just, they put you in the hard stuff and it came out. Like what, what's actually in there? Well, now they, they evaluate that and they teach it. So it's completely changed. The guys coming through the program it's nowadays are their own point. Like we can bag on them and they're a bunch of bitches. And I mean, they're putting, I, <laughs> well, I get that. I appreciate you saying it, but I'm going to tell you that you are an example of that evolution too. And, and that's something that's very dear to me in the teams because we all care very much. I mean, I only cared about a few things in my life and, and, and the first piece of metal was my trident. And the others were badges that I wore. I still as a, stare at that thing. Uh, well, as I a, can't as, help it as a police officer. But when you leave the teams, you don't just say, "Well, yeah, I was I was a frogman, and and that was that." You want to know that everything that we've done keeps being carried on because I know that we're trying to always do good, and we do good in a very that, unique way. In our in the in our purest form, we're always trying to do that true and no one i to this day i'm sure it still holds true there was no one is physical uh and 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 capable and and to do that you have to have the mind they're teaching that now which is what they should do for me i had to learn it on my own and then take that into law enforcement and more life death situations and and i've always been though the person that assessed i got through an evolution and I would assess that. How did that work? And why did I? And, and because the key was for me, uh, and, and, and that's a good point, I'll drop it there. But the key was for me, uh, so being on SEAL Team One, I have the Asian uh, theater of operations. And, and so it wasn't routinely taught uh, fighting skills in the teams. Some platoons would take more, more, uh, 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 of a point to make it happen, but I went out and studied on my own, every country we went to, and uh, the reality of it was, I'm, I'm not studying with some, some dojo that, that has business. These are real people that it was part of their culture. Oh yeah, that's, they yeah, were that's right, yeah, absolutely, we and, get that. And, and I couldn't that. pay to be, st- I had to sweep floors or serve tea until they, they didn't care if I was a seal or not. For, I'm still a friggin', you know, American gravy sucking pig, so I had to <laughs> tell them that I'm here to, yeah. and I care. But you know, one of the first things I learned at this time was it wasn't about muscle, it wasn't about brown, it was about the mind. And so I was taught early on, I had the luxury of learning that it was about the mind. And the uniqueness of that was I was able to apply the value of the mind to more experience at a young frogman instead of most people don't think about the mind till they get old that's what happened to me and they start I, I, i'm that guy like when well, you talk about the evolution you evaluate it i would forget it like if we went through it and did it hit it and forget it i i, I and then later like now it's catching up with me i'll i'll, I'll replay the scenario man and now i'm doing my reflecting mm. and I, I i get a great deal of that when i come across y'all don't you people believe that but <laughs> I'll take that's part a, of that. That's the best work. part about having the team guys, because in the middle of the moment, they'll have one guy who's talking smack, one guy who's upset, no, true, one guy who's evaluating, no. one guy trying to get us through it, one guy laughing, one guy doesn't even give a damn. Yep, we're all there at you the know, same that, moment. That remind me of the subject where I lost track again. We were talking before the show started. It was one of the things that Marcinko did at the team that that I always remembered very strongly, and I brought it out in every law enforcement unit that I was part of or that I trained. And he made it clear to the guys, because in those days, six, I believe, was on call anywhere in the world, and I forget, it was 11 hours or 14 hours, something like that. Oh, yeah. And we had three teams, even though there were only two teams, you'd have a team that was on leave, a team that was in training, and a team that was ready to go. Standby. Right. 
and you couldn't, you know, stand by a team, you you don't go out. They're party, pretty adamant about drink. that too. I knew a guy who 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 tried to get around that rule, and they didn't they didn't have it. There you go. So you're never too good enough to get your ass booted out of there. But no, that's for sure. And right. and, and here they're real point. funny about that. Well, and, and it should have been that way. It's just yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Skipper told you he said, "Here's the deal." Two things. I, I'll probably forget the second one, but the first one was, if you come in on a call and you've been drinking too much, you had a fight with your wife, anything else that made you less than a hundred percent, you have to tell me. I'll make the decision on whether you can you're good to go or not. Mm -hmm. But if you don't tell me, that's the worst. And something goes wrong, mm -hmm. what was you? You're gone. That. It was absolutely necessary. And no one should be afraid of handling things like that. And that's why every time in law enforcement I was part of any kind of unit like that, I made it clear to everybody I work with that I gave them those same rules. Mm -hmm. You've got to be there 100%. If yeah. you're not, be responsible to everyone else yeah. and say so. But if you don't and you screw up, you're gone. And I could care less. Uh, the other thing that Skipper did was more tactical. Actually, I'm not even going to go into that one. Moving on. I remember him <laughs> set. The, I remember those yeah, those rules right. setting up too. Because then you guys can walk in. Like some of us, you can tell. You can just tell if we've been hitting hitting the, at the drinking. Absolutely. We just we just can't help it. Absolutely. And then some of them can hide it. Some of them do. Some of our boys can well, hide that shit, yeah, man. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> guys, so that's trended. that's. But I yeah. mean, they're the best ones to watch them fess up. You're like. Yeah, I'm good. Of course, I'm good. I'm the best at it. Yeah, you yeah. Know, maybe I had a little. You know, that yeah. kind of those the senior chiefs, the yeah. freaking senior chiefs, man. Well, freaking great at that. So once you transitioned out of the teams, and what made you decide to go into law enforcement right after that? Well, um, let me address one thing on that yeah. drinking thing uh, because it is something that comes up about you know it's kind of synonymous with Dick and and the team sometimes and. I'm not going to say that that, that that the skipper was perfect or anything like that. Uh, I, I will say a lot, and, and, and everybody has their flaws, I believe. Um, I've never met Christ, but I, I expect you know he's he, he doesn't perhaps. But you got to remember, we talked about this. We've skirted this before. When, when we talk about the teams and what, what our job was, we're not talking about people that are hanging wallpaper or doing building or uh, something. If you make a stake, mistake, you can recover. We're, we're talking about people that are putting their lives on the line. And more importantly, Marcus has said this many times, very, very properly, my responsibility is to him and his to me. And I better be friggin' on my game. It, people don't realize they see war movies and the guys engage. Well, first of all, you, you got to be able to hit the target. You got to be able to hit the target that the other guy isn't shooting at. How do you communicate that? And imagine trying to do that under fire where you can't hear a damn thing and people are still trying to communicate. But the, I can go on and on. But um, you got to know that these guys are going to do that. America routinely isn't in those days, peacetime. We're not involved. They don't let us be involved. And that's one of the things that Dick was going to do that I felt was unique. Being on site with other countries. Go ahead and call us, you know, land graders, whatever, but at least we get the experience. We're bloody nose fighters. The United States gets beat up and then you send the guys to war. They have no experience. So we're gonna get our ass handed to us in the beginning because we've got people there that don't have any experience. And one of the things that's why Dick tried to create the brotherhood and the bond so that there be more of a responsibility yeah, and, and that often came in a social experience. The sad part about that is some people, that social experience can become a disease, mm. I guess. So it wasn't just about getting together and getting drunk. That wasn't it at all. I, I used to love to sit near the skipper and he's talking to somebody knew or anything and and he'd be talking and the next thing you know and of course he he used some colorful language everything he did he did it's a trick he did 
to see if that person was listening. He did to get that person, because was that person, we, if I said something vulgar, did it bother them? And now he knows. And every now and then he'll stop and say, oh, yeah, and something totally obscure, you know, uh, something weird, you know, and that red car went down the street and then he'd get back to the conversation. Did the guy catch it? Was the guy actually listening to what he was saying? Mm -hmm. He did that throughout. And so that was the thing. He, he, a lot of people, and critique him on that, but these guys could be going to war any minute. Are they going to be able to do it? Will they handle it? Because remember, the other part about it was uh, Mr. Marcinko wasn't a really good politician. And uh, uh, and remember, I, I'm a Cold War for all. And the other thing is, I'm not, I'm not making any claims to, that, that I was uh, a big six operator or anything else like that. No, I wasn't. I wasn't at six very long at all, um, because Mr. Marcinko was forced to leave while I was there, and I didn't know that was going to happen. We talked about that earlier. We got frogs that are great; they can communicate and talk to you. And then we got guys that you don't. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, that's not the guy you put up there for that. You yeah. put this guy there for that. It doesn't make him a bad guy. It just makes him. And everyone has a friend like that. Everybody knows somebody like that. I, I don't. I don't know why that is, but that that's absolutely true. And 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 um, that I blame myself. I think you know when something happens over and over again, finally you got to look in the mirror and say, "I think it's me." Is it him? No, that's no, me. And that was my my feeling. But yeah, there could have been greater communication because um, I just, I don't know. Sometimes uh, they just feel like you're supposed to know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But for me, that was the, the, the point there. Skipper was gone. And um, I'm looking at that and thinking, shit, that wasn't supposed to happen. And the guy coming in to replace him was a respectable frog man and a Vietnam veteran, but he was going to change the team and run it differently. Uh, I won't go into that more because I've had some run-ins with this, and some people held that against me that I left the team. But uh, I might have been one of the youngest to go there, but I was the first one to leave under my own guys like that. And But what we were talking about was instead of sitting me down and saying why are you leaving let's discuss this that ceo ended up threatening me literally threatening me saying i'm going to take your nec away and for the folks that don't know in those days it's called the naval enlisted code and uh, frogmen today have a rating of frogmen in those days we didn't have a rating a frogman you were a sailor so in my case i was a gunner's mate i went to gunner's mate school and we only do that because, well, if I break my arm in buds and I can't become a frogman, I don't want to be peeling potatoes on a battleship. But uh, that meant that, well, if you wanted to come back in the Navy, and that happened to a lot of guys. A lot of guys leave and they don't like the civilian world and they come right back. Um, but I, I looked at that and I thought, wait a minute, I, I, I'm a 4 old sailor. I've got a good reputation. I've got a good reta reputation as an operator. Why would you do that? And you can't do that. And I ended up getting a lawyer, and next thing you know, uh, that was changed. But up until that process, I'm a young man. Somebody could have said, hey, Chris, and sit down and said, why are you doing this? And this is the way the world is. And, and maybe I would have learned it sooner than what I did learn. And what I ended up having to learn and for all the young people that, that may be thinking about that or for the parents looking for a way to discuss it with them, look, the reality of life is, from me, you can't change the world. You have to learn how to navigate accordingly. You can change and affect people around you, and that's what you should be thinking more about. Had I understood that sooner, why I'd have a couple retirements by this point instead of turning in three different police badges and, and my trident along the way because it wasn't perfect in the way I thought it was going to be. So, and that's where I think we were talking about not only that, but... I mean, look at all this stuff that you've gotten into. You've, I, I hear you say that. I've heard a lot, a few guys say that. Like they kept moving and moving, chasing something. But then you got to look back at what you've, you've, you've accomplished and what you've been through. That in itself is amazing. Mm hmm well, I appreciate you saying that, but I, I don't ever, I've always wondered. It's always been uh, the big question for me. I know I was made to do that, but they didn't give me my war. I kept missing it. 
just like that. I left six, 30 days before Grenada. And I, that's disrespectful for me to say because guys lost their life there. But I didn't know and they didn't know because I called right away. Oh. And, and they told me, and, and the one guy told me that if we knew, we would have told you. Um, and God bless them. They gave their lives there. And we lost some great guys there, but no but, period. For me, though, I, I, I thought... I excelled in that, and I thought I'd get that opportunity. And and then I went into law enforcement, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I excelled there. Law enforcement, to me, was like a laboratory. kind of goes back to what you are saying. So what happened? Well, once I realized that Mr. Marcinko was leaving and uh, the team was going to change, and they had forgotten to sign me up the way I was supposed to because if you make it to a special team, why, well, you're going to – Re up, no matter what, it kind of right, goes yeah. without saying. And I, the yeoman, the, the the admin guys were friends of mine. And I told them sit on it as long as you can because I'm not sure. But in the end, I decided no. And getting past that, the point was, well, I, I wanted to do that job. So now it is. It's kind of saying, and this is really sounds horrible, and and maybe is the definition of a young man. But I, where is there a war I can get in? Where can I stand up for somebody and fight, but for a reason, for a purpose? Yeah. I've learned later that we all may search for a purpose, but it's not that complicated. Just be purposeful. And for me, the only, the only place that I could basically have a walk on war was in law enforcement. And uh, Mr. Marcinko, was let, he was moved from the team by that time. And uh, I went through all my thing, and then finally the head of Spec War Two, after the lawyer contacted him, told the new CO six, "You can't hurt this kid. You didn't sign him up. He's leaving. That's that." And you know they, w that was at the end. Uh, the green team they had the new expansion team. We had two blue and gold, and most of my friends from one were on blue, and they were putting me on red, and I was a kid again. Somebody just would have told me, hey, it's not a big deal, you know. But anyway, so leaving, and uh, Mr. Marcinko actually called me and, and before the team left and said, okay, I heard the news. What are you going to do? And I told him, he said, well, good. You're going to go to school. Uh, I want you to try something else. I'm not going to go into what that something else was, but after that period of the something else, I ended up going to school. I had an opportunity. I ended up in New Jersey. So I thought, well, I'll go to Rutgers. And uh, Rutgers had a lacrosse team. And I could be a cop, go to school. How old are you now? And play lacrosse. At How old are you at this time? I'm 67. Yeah. No, then. Oh, then. No. Uh, I went in at. Right out of teams, right? Yeah. So, 20s? I, I went at 18, so early 20s. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And. Um, and there you go. I, I started law enforcement, and the first thing that happened was the people. I started at Rutgers, very proud of that. And uh, Rutgers is a unique place. I met some good people there. I went through a police academy. I told you about that. Uh, my first, I've gone through so many police academies and SWAT schools in my life now. I thought if I ever wrote a book, I'd call it Boot Camp. Because <laughs> I just kept doing it and doing it. I doing mean, there's got to be one guy that's done all of those, right? Well, and you, you know, on track for that? How many guys though would be willing to start over new? Yeah, that's you got great. a lot of guys that are. Well, our guys it. don't like to do that. Well, I, I know a lot of guys that they they go to a police department and say, "Hey, I'm a fucking seal. I Give get me, it. Just it's, hand me a badge." Yeah, right. You know, but it wasn't Starting like starting over is tough. I'm doing that right now. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's just. Well, you know, you're doing it right though. Yeah, you know, we talked about that too, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to be all over the place, but if I'm not, I'll never remember. Well, Marcus and I were talking about something earlier, and I'm going to bring it up here again. And remember, I I found life kind of boring. That's why I jumped on an airplane. Really didn't do anything for my father. Rules. It was easy day. I mean, that was my career in law in the SEAL team. I, whatever it was, it was like whatever. Just teach me how to do it, and I wasn't thinking about it. But whether that's true or not for other people, the one thing about life that I know that is real and, and is more important than anything else is life may be boring to me or someone like me, but what makes life is being able to share it with someone special. If you don't have that, then 
it's different. And so for anybody that knows, that hears me, having that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. And some of us get it sooner or later, I don't know, but that's one of the bad things about the teams we're talking about. First of all, it should be somebody that's willing to talk to people. Know that these are young men that are making decisions maybe that aren't the best decisions. They have to learn somewhere, but they don't do that. Why isn't there someone that talks to them about marriage, about that commitment, oh, understanding that. Yeah, we didn't have that. If, if this is going to, you're going to be away from home half the time of this relationship, mm -hmm. maybe it's something you should put off. I'm sure somebody's going to say there's some liability to that, but you know, uh, too many guys end up retiring, then all of a sudden they find themselves home. Well, Mrs. has been running the house all these years, and now you want to get involved? Oh, I know a bunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, but dude. I got a bunch of guys like that. Yeah. So it, that goes through our that goes through our lineage. That that particular uh, agreed predicament. Agreed. And so that's that's a tough thing. But back to the law enforcement. Which, which we got to give props to the to the wives that make it. Oh yeah. man, it's like going through buds for them when we're in. I mean, I didn't have to. I didn't have to do that, but. I, I know a bunch of them that did. That's why anybody that I ever met... Uh, you can't mess with them. Seal wives, they don't you, play. You, you, you have to give them tremendous credit and, and respect. And, and, and it's easy if you're looking from the outside in, but, you know, a lady that's married to a frogman is essentially a frogman. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. Don't buckle up, buttercup.